Doc, we can't hear you. Can you see my slides? Yes, doctor. Good morning once again. Good morning. So today we're going to look at the painful red eye. Uh, my name is Dr. Njambi. Uh, and this lecture is actually a revision of all the topics you've covered that cause a painful red eye. Uh, so I'll, it will just be a summary of the common causes of a painful red eye. Uh, if you need more details, you can refer to the specific topics that you are taught. If you have any queries, you can uh, put, them, put them in the chat. We'll look at them at the end. So we hope by the end of the session, you'll have a, be able to develop a differential diagnosis of a red eye and be able to differentiate between uh, the serious and benign conditions. and know when to refer if there's a serious case. Now, um, a red eye or an injected eye is what is referred to as a hyperemia of the superficial uh, visible vessels of the conjunctiva or the episclera or the sclera. Remember the conjunctiva is the outermost membrane covering the sclera. Between the sclera and the conjunctiva is what is called the episclera, a thin layer of um, vascular uh, structure. So what can cause a red eye? Usually are disorders of these uh, structures adjacent to the eye and the outer part of the eye. So other adjacent meaning issues to do with the eyelid, the cornea or the, the uvea. Remember the uvea is a uvea tract or the uvea comprises of the iris, ciliary body and the choroid. And those three can also give you, uh, inflammation of those three structures can also give you a red eye. So we we'll look at the issues affecting the conjunctiva, the sclera, the sclera, and the adjacent structures, which we call the adnexa. And those in general are the things that will give you a red eye. So when you look at a patient with a red eye, um, how they present, uh, as the topic suggests, it will most likely be painful. So when you ask about the pain, you need to ask the nature of the pain. Is it a sharp pain? Is it an ache or is some grittiness? Sometimes irritation, patients report irritation as pain. So you need to find out what kind of pain they are referring to because this can be a pointer to the cause. Check if there's discharge. Uh, this can be purulent, watery or mucoid. Purulent will point towards a bacterial infection. Uh, watery may be allergic or viral. Mucoid also uh, allergic. Uh, history of itching, severe itching <clears throat> mainly points towards um, allergic conjunctivitis. But patients with inflammation of the eyelids also and dry eye may also present with some form of itching. But the itching of allergic conjunctivitis is quite intense compared to the other causes of itching. Photophobia or sensitivity to light. This is due to the inflammation of the tissues. Find out whether there's any visual disturbance and if it is present, whether it's constant or variable. Uh, other relevant histories, history of contact lenses, use of glasses or uh, being on treatment for or symptoms of refractive error. So when you go to systemic review, uh, you want to find out that any associated uh, systemic uh, symptoms like headache. Sometimes when uh, patients have allergy, they may complain of some dull headache, the frontal headache. Also refractive error can give you some uh, frontal headache. Abdominal pain and vomiting, this occur especially if you have acute rise in uh, intraocular pressure in what we call angle closure glaucoma. Uh, weight loss and joint pains can occur in things like um, rheumatoid arthritis or what we call uh, connective tissue disorders, which can give you either scleritis or uveitis, and this will present with a red eye. So you need to find out 
whether a patient has any other systemic uh, complaints. First, ocular history. History of recurrent iritis. Iritis is inflammation of the iris, part of the uvea. It can either be iritis or uveitis. Uh, previous corneal injury uh, or previous uh, corneal erosions or pain, uh, recurrent corneal ulcers. This can be either due to trauma or sometimes patients have inherent weakness in the cornea and they keep getting recurrent corneal erosions, which can actually be very painful in, associated with a red eye. Autoimmune diseases in the past medical history, uh, especially the HLA-B27, the juvenile idiopathic arthritis, uh, because of the association with the uveitis. Bleeding disorders, because if a patient has a bleeding disorder, they could bleed onto the eye and it will present her as a bleeding, as a red eye. Uh, atopy because of history of allergy. So family history again, allergy and um, atopy. This will point towards allergic conjunctivitis and also um, having the same in the family history. Could, you could either have this in the family history or just in the past medical history, depending on how the patient presents. Uh, drugs such as offering you know, and other drugs that can cause uh, bleeding. Uh, social history, occupation may matter, like in construction and uh, some um, occupational hazards, which may uh, have chemicals or particles entering the eye and injuring the eye or causing constant irritation. Infectious uh, contacts with uh, microbes or even animals, because animals can cause something like allergic uh, response. Also, things like cats and dogs can give you toxocariasis. Uh, which can give you a uh, uveitis and present with uh, a red eye. So when you examine the patient, uh, what do you look for? You look at the conjunctiva, a red inflamed conjunctiva, we call it injected. So you find uh, in the examination notes, we either write the conjunctiva is injected or not injected, meaning either it's hyperemic or uh, it is looking red or not. Cornea, when you look at the cornea, look at the deposit, uh, haziness, is there a surface defect? Are there a foreign body or any disturbances on the ocular surface in terms of the smoothness and the uh, clarity? Anterior chamber, uh, look at uh, the haziness, the exit shallow or is it of the right uh, depth? Is there a hypopion? Hypopion is a pass. In the anterior chamber, that will point towards an infection. Is there a hyphema? We point towards either trauma, serious uveitis, or uh, a bleeding disorder, or a malignancy that is causing bleeding into the anterior chamber. The iris, uh, whether there's any defects or anything that is bulging. Pupils, shape, size, and reaction to light. Posterior chamber, if you have inflammation extending into the posterior chamber, for example, if you have an uh, infection, like in endophthalmitis or severe uveitis, uh, you may find the posterior segment is hazy and view of the fundus is not clear. Retina, uh, if you have associated uh, uh, infection or inflammation of the retina, you could have what we call cotton wool spots or vasculitis, having the vessels uh, inflamed. Uh, so we look at the specific disorders in brief. Uh, blepharitis, we start with the diseases of the adnexa. Adnexa is the tissues surrounding the eye, that is the eyelids, the eyelashes. Um, so if you have, we start with um, the blepharitis, which is the inflammation uh, or infection around the eyelids. So patients who have eyelid issues will have um, redness, swelling, and tenderness, like shown in this uh, picture. Let me see if I can get my pointer. Sorry, I don't seem to, to trace it. I mean, I'll just use this. I hope you can see here. You can see that swelling here around there. Eyelid, uh, that is what is called a uh, sty. 
when there is also uh when you look at the eyelashes you could also the patient may complain about itching remember i said itching is very significant in uh, allergic conjunctivitis but uh diseases affecting the eyelids and dry eye will also cause some form of itching mm -hmm. so uh you could also have some greasy or flaky or scaly scales around the eyelashes as you can see here and crusting this tells you there's a problem with the eyelashes and if, when the patient has this uh blepharitis they could also have a dry uh dry eye sensation they could have grittiness irritation because some of the tears are produced at the uh oily glands along the lid margin and this is affected when you have blepharitis so this one for treatment you need to give warm compress so that you clear this uh, blockage and the inflammation and some lubrication. Sometimes you may can use a steroid antibiotic, uh, eye drop or cream, but if there's a style pointing towards infectious course, then you use a plain antibiotic. The next condition in the adnexa is what we call dacryocystitis, and this is inflammation of the lacrimal duct. Remember the lacrimal duct is situated around the eye, uh, between the eye and the nose in this space. So you could have swelling and uh, pus in the sac. And if this persists for long, it could actually perforate as you have seen here and cause a fistula. Uh, if it is not well treated, it could even extend into the nasal cavity and cause infection. So for this, you need to do also massage, give antibiotics and you may need surgical intervention. Another condition uh, on the adnexa is what we call a sty, like I shown, had shown you before in the previous uh, slide. A sty is just an infectious swelling around the <coughs> eyelid, <coughs> sorry, which may look like a pimple, and sometimes it may burst and give, uh, and you find pus coming out. So in that case, uh, treatment will need a warm compress with antibiotics. There is another swelling that may occur around the eyelid, which is called a calasion. And this is caused by <coughs> blockage of the tear ducts. Remember, I've said that the oily uh, component of the tear film is produced at the eyelid margin. And sometimes that gets blocked and uh, you have uh, the limp lipid material accumulating, and that gives you a calasion. So initially, a calasion is not painful, it is painless, a uh, firm swelling as uh, shown in these pictures. Uh, if it gets infected, you could get secondary uh, uh, infection and the formation of pus and it becomes painful. So calasion uh, treatment is warm compress. You may use a steroid antibiotic uh, cream. And if it persists, you could do curettage to remove the accumulated lipid material. The other swelling uh, on the eyelids is the um, what we call the periorbital cellulitis. Um, periorbital cellulitis is different from orbital cellulitis, and look at the differences uh, in a minute. So when you have periorbital cellulitis, you get uh, fever, you get pain, swelling of the eyelid, but there is no proptosis, as opposed to orbital cellulitis where there is proptosis. You could also get mechanical torsis because the eyelid is uh, edematous and you have tender and tenderness and redness around the eye. So for this one, you need to give systemic antibiotics uh, accompanied by also warm compress and you may also need the topical antibiotics. So this is also a case uh, of uh, periorbital cellulitis in an adult, which can complicate and give you a peri Subperiosteal abscess. You could also get cavernous sinus thrombosis, intracranial abscess, and subsequent visual loss and even death. So much as periorbital cellulitis has not crossed the to go into the deep orbital tissues and give uh, uh, orbital cellulitis, that is one of the risks that it can extend and become an orbital cellulitis and spread into the brain and the rest of the body and give you. Um, Septicemia and even death. It's a very serious infection which needs to be treated aggressively. 
So another condition in the adnexa is a uh, Bell's palsy. Now, uh, when you have uh, Bell's palsy, palsy, which gives you a seventh nerve um, palsy, you'll have a lagophthalmos, and therefore the patient is not able to close the eyelid. And that gives you a persistent dry eye uh, because during the closing and opening of the eyelid is when you have the, the wetting of the surfaces of the cornea. So if this persists, you get a dry eye, and if it's not treated well, the cornea will melt and give a corneal ulcer and can even give you a perforation, which is now called exposure keratopathy. So for this one, uh, as we wait for, if it is a temporary Bell's palsy, as we wait for the palsy to resolve, you may need to close the eyelid um, by stitching them together, what we call a tassography, to reduce the risk of dryness of the uh, cornea and even perforation and melting due to persistent dryness. And at the same time, you give a lot of lubricants. So we go to conjunctival disorders. Uh, the first that is shown there is uh, various levels of subconjunctival hemorrhage. This can occur from trauma. It could also occur if someone has a bleeding disorder or uh, in some malignancies, uh, patients may present with uh, bleeding on the conjunctiva, and sometimes uh, uncontrolled uh, hypertension. Sometimes you have the small vessels of the um, conjunctiva rupturing and giving you a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Occasionally, it may occur when you have um, uh, increased balsava maneuver, like in vomiting or persistent coughing, or as sometimes uh, in trauma, very trivial trauma, you find you've rubbed uh, the eye or some uh, child has rubbed the eye when sleeping and they wake up with a red eye. So this may not be initially painful, but there's some grittiness and discomfort because of the, the swelling associated with the hemorrhage. And treatment, uh, if there's no systemic cause, you, you may give lubrication. It just needs time for the blood to resolve on its own. But very important, you must rule out uh, any systemic condition because it could be a sign of a, another serious uh, problem, especially the bleeding disorders and hypertension. So when you have conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis is inflammation of the conjunctiva. And there are many types of, con of conjunctivitis as you had been taught, allergic, infectious, irritative, or could have neonatal conjunctivitis or what we call Thamian unatorum. So when it is viral, uh, you may sometimes it can be a bit different, difficult to differentiate. But remember, uh, sometimes the amount of discharge may, may be a sign or a pointer to the cause of the um, conjunctivitis. When it is viral, uh, we said uh, the discharge may be watery. But viral conjunctivitis can also be complicated by bacterial infection. If you have bacterial infection, then the discharge will be purulent. Allergic, uh, the, if there's no infection, the discharge is mainly uh, mucoid or watery, and there will be a lot of itching. And all this will be associated with a red eye. So when it is viral, you may observe, you may give artificial tears, and um, be careful because you could get secondary infection bacteria infection. Bacterial conjunctivitis uh, give broad spectrum antibiotics um, topically, unless it is in ophthalmia neonatorum, where you have to add uh, systemic antibiotics. Allergic will give anti-allergy medication uh, accompanied with by cool compresses. For allergy, we don't give warm compress. You give, you do compresses with cool water or ice water. <clears throat> so this is more on the conjunctivitis. So allergic, inflamed uh, red eye. If the allergy has been there for long and persistent, you could uh, get um, this brownish pigmentation that tells you the allergy has been there and untreated for a very long time. Bacterial conjunctivitis, very purulent discharge. It may not be at this level. This, maybe this could be like in ophthalmia unatorum or gonococcal conjunctivitis in adults. Um, sometimes the discharge is scanty, but it's still purulent, like in this picture, and the eyelashes are matted. This tells you there's some infection. 
Viral conjunctivitis, especially the commonest cause, which is adenovirus, gives you a very red eye, which may mimic um, subconjunctival hemorrhage. This eye is so red. And you also get what we call pseudo membranes, as shown in this um, picture in the furnaces. So, again, bacterial conjunctivitis, just to emphasize, purulent discharge, a very red eye. Uh, and you can see the discharge here, copious purulent. At this level, I'll be thinking about of neonatal conjunctivitis or in adults, gonococcal conjunctivitis. Uh, other bacteria may give some significant uh, discharge, but may not be at, to this level. And when the tissues are very inflamed, there is maybe what we call conjunctiva edema. You may not be able to appreciate with the naked eye, but sometimes when you look at the sleep clamp, you see the, the swelling of the conjunctiva, what we call chemosis. So viral, just to emphasize, very red eye. Um, not much discharge. If it is there, it may just be like tearing or watery. Sometimes the patient may also have a, a flu that can point and help you make the diagnosis. And then if there's not much itching, then most likely the cause may be allergic. Sorry, viral. Remember, in allergic, sometimes patients may have allergic rhinitis. So you have to be careful to find out the difference. If this has been something that comes on and off or has a past history, most likely with significant itching, then it may just be uh, allergic. Here, uh, pseudomembranes with watery discharge. If you see purulent discharge in a patient who you're suspecting a viral or has pseudomembranes, then most likely you, you have secondary bacterial infection. You could also get... Um, Usually you don't get fungal conjunctivitis, but you could get fungal corneal ulcer, which you're going to look at later. So other corneal diseases, irritative. Um, so now we've moved to corneal diseases. And we start with irritative causes. Remember I mentioned about dry eye. If you have persistent dry eye, for example, from persistent So, or computer use and screens, or if they have underlying inflammation of the conjunctiva, like in chronic uh, allergic conjunctivitis, then they have associated uh, persistent uh, dry eye. And this will give you, if the cornea is not well, um, is not lubricated well, you get this punctate staining or these spots on the cornea small, small erosions on the cornea because of the persistent dryness. And we, when you put fluorescein, then you get stain. Can you still hear me? Yes, doctor, we can hear you. Okay, because my internet it's saying is unstable, I hope. If you don't hear me, please just call me. Okay, doctor. Yeah, so I hope you are together up to there. Yes, we have been together. Okay. So going on to Corneal diseases, so we just looked at dry eye, persistent dry eye. Another cause in the cornea will be a foreign body, which will be irritating in the first place, and will also give you a, dry, a foreign body sensation. If you examine, you may be able to pick the foreign body, like you can see in this picture. You have this metallic uh, foreign body on the cornea. So this needs to be removed and the patient treated with antibiotic uh, eye drops to prevent infection and to promote healing. So infections on the cornea, so corneal ulcers. So as I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, on the cornea, you may have fungal infection. Remember in the conjunctiva, we are not mentioning the fungus so much, mainly it affects the cornea. You could get a bacterial infection Still, again, uh, you'll get, when you have bacteria, remember you get purulent discharge. Viral, watery discharge, unless there's secondary <coughs> bacterial infection. Uh, fungus, the discharge may be between the bacteria and viral, a bit of mucoid and a bit of purulent, but not watery. Uh, when you have viral uh, infection on the cornea, 
The commonest virus is the happy simplex virus. Others may affect the cornea, but this is the commonest. So a cornea ulcer, you need to stain to be able to appreciate it well. Um, here you can get, you find a very, this is like a fungal cornea ulcer, very deep with some infiltrates on the periphery and a hazy cornea in general. This is a viral, sorry, viral ulcer, the dendritic pattern. And this is a, a bacterial uh, ulcer. It could also go for fungal. You can see it has this feathery uh, margins, uh, infiltrates extending to the normal cornea. When it is purely bacteria, you get a very well demarcated um, ulcer. But when it's fungal, you find the margins are not very well defined. And you can find this patient also has a hypopion pass in the anterior chamber, which occurs very commonly with fungal keratitis. So more examples. Remember, uh, corneal diseases, for you to perceive them, you stain with fluorescein. It's the commonest dye we have. You look at the pattern. So again, dendritic pattern for viral uh, corneal ulcer. This could be bacteria or fungal, depending on the presentation. The margins look a little well-defined, so maybe bacterial. There's a small hypopion there. Remember both bacteria or fungal can give you hypopion, but it is more common in fungal keratitis or corneal ulcers. Same here, you can see some staining here. This is what we call punctate staining. Just looks like small, small dots which can occur in a severe dry eye when the cornea is very dry. This is a, we call it a geographical ulcer when the especially viral ulcers are not treated well, they just extend and involve a very large portion of the cornea and this we call geographical ulcers. So moving on to the other cause of the red eye. So we go to the uvia system, uh, uveitis, as we said, uveitis, inflammation of the uvia. We say the uvia tract is the iris, ciliary body, and the choroid. So patients with uveitis get, uh, have very severe pain, which is acute with very significant um, photophobia. And the pain is also significant. They may have blurring of vision because of um, when you have inflammation of the uvea tract, you get leakage of proteins into the anterior chamber and it makes it, it makes the aqueous cloudy and that blurs the vision. There's also a lot of uh, lacrimation because of the um, photophobia and the sensitivity of the cornea. Then you get, sometimes it is characteristic, sometimes it is not very characteristic, this circumcorneal redness. Uh, they say it's called ciliary injection, that the redness is around the limbus. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes you just have some generalized redness. But what is very striking about uveitis is a significant amount of pain and sensitivity to light, where the patient even has to close, like cover their eyes for them to be comfortable. When you see someone like that, unless the other differential could just be a foreign body, but such significant photosensitivity of very sudden onset may point towards uveitis. And the pupil may be small, but later they become irregular as we will see in the next slides. So because of the inflammation, you remember we said uh, they will have proteins leaking through the, uh, because of the inflammation of the uveal tracts into the uh, anterior chamber in the aqueous and part of the, the proteins that leak, they'll settle on the cornea and give you these deposits on the inferior part of the cornea, which may be whitish or brownish. And to start, they're brownish, then later they become whitish. They are called keratic precipitate. This is very characteristic of uveitis. You see this on the cornea and you know the patient has uveitis. Because of the prolonged uh, inflammation and the leakage of proteins, you find the iris uh, sticking onto the lens giving you what we call posterior synechia. So this attachment of the iris into the uh, lens is called posterior synechia. Persistent inflammation will also give you a cataract. So these are some of the signs that you may see in a patient with uveitis. You may not be able to appreciate the keratic precipitates, but if the inflammation is intense, 
you can use you can be able to see this uh, irregular shape of the of the iris of, of the pupil which we call festooned pupil this you can be actually be able to appreciate with a torch and you could also be able to appreciate the the cataract and sometimes also because of the persistent inflammation you have deposits of the uvior tissue on the lens like you see here this is very characteristic of uveitis so depending on the cause, you need to treat the cause. Some UVH is idiopathic. Other, as you said, is associated with the uh, autoimmune diseases. Others is uh, due to infections like uh, torches, um, CMV, viruses. So there are many causes. So you may need to investigate and see how to treat the patient accordingly. But for the specific treatment of UVH, you need a lot of steroids to slow down this inflammation and reverse this, uh, uh, these features before complications arise. So we move on to the another cause of uh, painful um, red eye. And here, in terms of glaucoma, we just look at uh, angle closure glaucoma. Remember, primary open angle glaucoma may not be painful because the angle is not closed. The pressure is very high. Unless the pressure is extremely high, the primary open angle glaucoma may not be painful. But angle closure glaucoma usually occurs very suddenly, and you have sudden rise in the, in the pressures in the eye, and may be associated with headache, vomiting. So this is an emergency that needs to be treated uh, very fast to bring down the, the, the pressures and make the patient comfortable. And also when you examine the anterior chamber, because the angle, there's something, many times either the blockage is at the level of the pupil, so the aqueous is not able to move from the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber. Sometimes it could just be from uveitis, as I've shown, if you get the whole iris attaching 360 degrees onto the lens, then the aqueous passage will be blocked. That can give you angle closure glaucoma. Other cases may occur Post surgery, others you may just find that, like in, in cataract, the lens may swell suddenly and push the iris forward. The lens forward touches the lens and blocks the passage of the uh, aqueous. So you find that because of the iris has moved forward, which we call it iris bombe, you, the anterior chamber is very shallow. When you examine with a torch, patient is in a lot of pain. The IOP is very high, and the cornea may also be hazy because of the high pressures in the eye. So this one is a very uh, uh, important case that needs an emergency treatment and uh, quick referral to manage and relieve the pain and bring down the, the pressures. So we go to the next course of the painful red eye, endophthalmitis. So endophthalmitis is inflammation of the inner coats of the eye. So usually the whole eye is involved from the cornea all the way up to the retina. So patient will have sudden drop in vision, very severe pain. Uh, there may be swelling, eyelid swelling. There may be some discharge. Your cornea will be hazy as the level of haziness may vary, but it may be up to this level. You may have Hypopion, as you see here, and the reflex, because also the vitreous is, the retina is affected, the vitreous is also um, involved, you have a yellow reflex. Remember, endophthalmitis is one of the causes of a white reflex, because you'll have the internal coats affected, you have inflammation. If it is infective, you may have pus, and this will present as a white reflex. Another serious emergency that needs urgent referral because this can result in blindness within very a uh, very short time, and can also extend to cause systemic infection. But remember, also sister, severe systemic septicemia infections can also give you endogenous endophthalmitis, where now the infection is coming from inside. So you could have infections starting in the eye, starting from trauma, post-surgery, but you could also have infection in very sick children, especially children and adults, or some maybe 
very sick patients in ICU, they could also present with end, um, endophthalmitis because of the severe uh, septicemia and the weak uh, immune system. So moving on to trauma. So trauma can cause any of the things that we've been talking about from uh, conjunctivitis, could get a traumatic conjunctivitis, foreign body, corneal ulcer, subconjunctival hemorrhage. It can give you an eviatis. Um, when sometimes uh, when it's post-traumatic, you could even get a hyphema. This is blood in the anterior chamber, which we call hyphema. This, I hope it can depict what I was trying to show. In eviatis, you have circumciliary or yeah, perilimbo injection, that redness that is around the limbus. When you see a patient with that such sort of redness and severe sensitivity to light and severe pain, think of uveitis as your number one differential. Uh, you could get also post-traumatic uh, uveitis with cataracts as shown in this case. So depending on the cost, patient may present with similar findings, but the cost may be different. And that one you are able to elicit from the history. So um, this is a table to just summarize what we've been talking about. Um, remember, when you have a painful red eye, it could be things around the eye or at nexa, the tissues around the, <clears throat> the eye. Uh, and depending on uh, the cause, you will find that uh, <clears throat> you could get infectious causes, if it is corneal ulcer, angle closure, endophthalmitis, and um, trauma. This is something about scleritis and episcleritis. Mm. I, I'll go through this. I think, uh, let me just see whether it's in this slide. Allow me to re remove this screen and bring share something else because there's a slide missing about the scleritis and episcleritis. Is that okay? Two minutes. No problem, doctor. Meanwhile, if you have any question, you could. Um, if you have any question, you can ask. <coughs> Any questions? Can you see that? Yes, doctor. I actually don't know what happened. I think when it said the internet is unstable, something happened because some slides did not appear. So let me just go through them. So we start with the episcleritis. Remember I mentioned about the episclera I want to remove this. Okay, let me just use this. Uh,
You are able to see that one? Uh, yes, episcleritis. Yes, yes. So yes, I okay. think the net skipped my some of my slides. I'm sorry about that. So um, episcleritis uh, is inflammation of the episclera. Episclera is just a thin uh, vascular tissue above the sclera, between the sclera and the conjunctiva. Now, what you also have something called uh, scleritis. Uh, the difference between episcleritis and uh, scleritis is that episcleritis is not as painful. And many times uh, you have some sectoral redness. As you can see in this patient, there's some redness just localized in this area. Not painful many times, or the pain is very minimal, some discomfort. <clears throat> and the vision is not usually affected. It may be unilateral and bilateral. And it has its habit of have big recurrency. You may have a patient get an attack, then after a year or two or some months, they get another attack. No visual disturbance, as I said, and uh, this usually is not associated with any systemic disorder. In many times it is self-limiting, but the recommended treatment is topical or systemic uh, non-NSAIDs for reducing the inflammation. So even if the patient doesn't get treatment, it will somehow resolve, but it's likely to recur. As opposed to scleritis, where the patient will have a painful eye, painful red eye. I think my net is letting me down, but you're almost done. So before we go to scleritis, as I was showing, you can have, you see this Spectral, just some localized redness. And at times you can have um, a nodule, a small nodule associated with it. Now there's a test we do in the clinic, but uh, you may not be able to do it all the time. If you put epinephrine on this redness, it improves if it is episcleritis, topical epinephrine. But what it also does, it dilates the pupil. So patients are not very happy because their vision gets blurry after visiting the doctor but that is one of the differentiating signs between episcleritis and scleritis. Uh, and involvement of the cornea is very rare. So this is a self-limiting uh, benign condition and many times no systemic association. Now scler scleritis is inflammation of the sclera and this presents with severe pain and photophobia. You could have the cornea involved as you see in this patient. Many times it is associated with systemic autoimmune diseases like uh, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis. So it is a more serious condition. Patient may also get uveitis um, and needs to be treated um, aggressively. So you need to find out the systemic association doing uh, workup and treat aggressively with uh, steroid uh, eye drops. You could also need uh, systemic steroids and uh, other immunosuppressive uh, treatment depending on the cause. So for this one, you need to refer urgently and the patient also need to, we need to also find out the, the cause of the condition so that you treat whatever is triggering the, the, this recurrent inflammation. If it is so persistent, you see here, the, the tissue is, the sclera is so inflamed, it has thinned and the bluish that you're seeing is the uvea that is almost uh, protruding through a very thin sclera due to recurrent inflammation. So for this one, the patient will be in a lot of pain, a lot of sensitivity, similar to what you see in uveitis. And when you examine, you may also see um, this inflammation, which does not disappear or blanch with epinephrine. And um, <clears throat> let, me, let me go back. It doesn't uh, disappear with the uh, epinephrine and the patient may also have systemic conditions. So that's why systemic history is very important so that you're able to elicit whether this is just a purely eye problem or there is something else that is underlying. And the other condition that we, we skipped is uh, growth on the conjunctiva. The two common ones are uh, pterygium and pinguecula, yeah? Pterygium, both of them are fibrovascular growth proliferation triggered by UV light uh, on the conjunctiva. So when it in, grows to invade the cornea, like in this case, is what we, when we call it a 
the region. When it is just localized on the conjunctiva, we call it a quinguecula. And this because it's an elevated lesion, causes a lot of grittiness, dryness, and sometimes they get inflamed. So they can get inflamed, become red and a little uncomfortable. They, just because it's an elevated surface, it will give, the, give you dry eye and irritation and redness. So those are the two mechanisms it can cause uh, discomfort on the eye and redness. If this grows and reaches the, the visual axis, it will give you blurring of vision. It would also give you blurring because of astigmatism and pulling on the cornea. So I think those are the two slides that we missed. With that, I come to the end of the lecture, unless there's any question, any concern. So this is where we are. And this is just a summary of the many courses we've been talking about. Any question? Yes, Sorry. thank you, Dr. Jambi. There's yes. just some questions in the chat box. There are some questions, so let me stop sharing. Actually, it's just one. Okay. What causes episcleritis? Uh, usually it's those idiopathic things. Occasionally, a few people may, patients may have uh, connective tissue disorders, but this one is not strongly associated. What is strongly associated with the connective tissue diseases is scleritis. Episcleritis, it's one of those idiopathic inflammations on the eye. Same as uveitis. Remember, majority of the patients with uveitis, it will be idiopathic, yeah? But a few will have also have systemic diseases. I hope that is clear. So it's only when you examine that you're able to, to tell the difference and when you take a detailed history. Is there a treatment to reverse the brown discoloration from untreated conjunctivitis? Uh, not directly, but when you treat and uh, control the allergic conjunctivitis, the, brown, the brownish discoloration tends to improve. That brownish just tells you that this inflammation is uh, uh, ongoing. Sometimes it's low grade, you don't see it, and the patient may not even be rubbing their eyes. But when you see the eyes looking brownish, it tells you there's some low grade inflammation. So you control the allergy, and that way it helps to control the, the brownish pigmentation. So if it's been there for a very long time, it may all be go back to the you know, nice white eyes, but it will be better, much better than than they were, and it actually they improve significantly. They may not be crystal white, but they improve significantly. Uh, there's some, somebody asking, is that a beauty spot? I'm not sure which one. It is a beauty spot. Gideon. Or was that meant to be ours? As Gideon tries to clarify, any other concern? Uh, doctor, I don't know if you had answered the question about uh, on Nanyama. He, the question is, what did you say? Oh, the first one, uh, okay. Yes. okay. What did yes. you say can be a differential when you see perilimbo injection with photophobia and severe pain? The two, Number one and number two, when you have severe pain and severe photophobia, it's either uveitis or scleritis, because those are the two that will give you very significant pain and photophobia, and they may also have blurring of vision. Other conditions can also give you mimic that, but it will not be so classical as that perilimbo, like a ring around the limbus. That is very categorical of uveitis, and also Scleritis because it may also present with uveitis, associated uveitis. When you have scleritis, you find that the deep vessels are very engorged and the eye is very red. The patient is in a lot of discomfort. Okay, I hope that is clear. Uh, what you're still writing about the beauty spot, but as we wait, how would you differentiate the grittiness and foreign body sensation? It's mainly the same. 
sometimes uh, patients will tell you they feel rough, they feel like sand, they feel like there's a foreign body. All that, it's, it's the same at the same level as opposed to where they tell you there's pain. So when patient says they have pain, you need to find out. Sometimes they say they have pain. And actually when you, you, you go further, you realize there's just some form of breachiness and that tells you it's the eye is dry or there's some foreign body inside. Some will tell you directly they feel like they have a foreign body in the eye. Uh, when you put adrenaline drops, how long will the blurriness last? That um, will it last about uh, six hours because that's the duration of action. So I hope that's clear. Is there a need for IND in STI? Uh, initially, we start with antibiotic uh, treatment, systemic and topical. You have to give systemic. You don't have to like start with IND as primary treatment. You can start with antibiotic. Sometimes it bursts in on its own. If it does, then you can squeeze in whatever is remaining. If you if it's persistent despite the antibiotic treatment, you may drain it. But the first treatment, unless it's pointing and you can see there somewhere, it's just about to burst. We usually start with antibiotic, systemic, and topical. Give it time. If it doesn't resolve or it's threatening to burst, then you can, or it doesn't, uh, yeah, it doesn't resolve or it's threatening to burst, then you can do IND and combine with it antibiotics. Okay, any more questions? Recording so, stopped. If there's no other question, I hope that was useful. Is it the last lecture? No, doctor, we have one uh, next week. About uh, vision and something. I think so, but we had missed a few classes. Ah, so we okay. Need to make up. All right, okay then. Then if uh, you're good and happy, we can end the class. Yes, thank you so much for your time this morning, Dr. Njang. You're welcome and thank you for your good attendance. Have a nice day. You too, doctor. So how do we sign? Well, this is recorded and we use that as uh, evidence. Yes, yes. All right. Okay, then. Good day.